Uh, good morning. Uh, I am so glad that you are here uh, to listen to this uh, presentation today. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, uh, John Hauser and Dr. Montgomery for inviting me to give you this presentation today. Today's presentation will be on uh, how bacteria eat sugars and avoid death by poisons, uh, the anti-porter motif story, a multi-joint resistance, and synergistic killing of dangerous bacterial pathogens. So, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Dr. Manny Barella. I'm a professor of biology. Uh, I hold a doctorate in uh, biomedical sciences with an emphasis in uh, biochemistry and molecular biology. I have a postdoctoral training in microbial physiology at Harvard Medical School in Boston. Uh, and I've been a faculty here for about uh, 24 years now. Uh, some of the courses that I teach uh, include microbiology uh, in this laboratory. Uh, I also teach a course in microbial physiology at its laboratory. I teach also a course in immunology, the study of how microbes, uh, how, we, how, how uh, humans uh, protect uh, each uh, other from uh, microbes and cancer. I also teach a course in medical microbiology, which is mainly uh, uh, bacterial and viral pathogens. And then I teach a course in uh, virology, the study of how viruses infect uh, uh, host cells. I also do advising here at Eastern New Mexico University. I advise students who are in pre-medicine and uh, who emphasize in molecular biology, microbiology, and biotechnology, just in case you might be interested in uh, majoring in biology and emphasizing in these areas. Um, some of the research I do has to do with uh, solute transporters. Now, it turns out that all cells in the world, all living cells, um, uh, are covered by a membrane that serves as a barrier to the entrance of nutrients and the exit of dangerous substances that would harm those cells. So this barrier, though, must be overcome in order for cells to live, to grow, and for cells to survive any kind of poison they may encounter. So um, solute transporters will sit in the membrane and then permit this entry of uh, nutrients and exit of the poisons. So um, solute transporters then are essential for the living uh, for, for, for all life on Earth, for all living organisms, from bacteria all the way up to humans. The, um, some of these transporters, though, are uh, defective in certain genetic diseases, like uh, adrenal leukodystrophy or cystic fibrosis and others. Um, and so a lot of them are poorly understood so at the time that I started studying, we kind of felt that these um, transporters were little uh, round black boxes with uh, very little known about them. So part of the, what we do know is that there are two main types of solute transporters, those that take ATP to energize them, to allow uh, substrates to come into a cell or to be um, exported from a cell. And there are secondary transport systems, which work with a proton gradient or some ion gradient of some sort. Uh, there are um, antiport systems that uh, will have a proton or an ion go into a cell, and then a, a product be pumped out of that cell. Um, symport proteins uh, work by having a proton and a solute enter the, uh, uh, the cell in, in both directions, in, in, in the same direction. Okay, so if you look at some of these proteins, you'll see how they have, consist of one large polypeptide chain that can traverse the membrane uh, many times, maybe up to a dozen, maybe up to 14. Uh, and at the time that I started uh, studying these things, we, uh, when I was at Harvard, we looked at the transport of sugars in bacteria, and we found that certain mutations could take a sugar, like mellibios, which is found in plants, and lactose, which is found in milk, uh, 
uh, and differentiate them where we could disconnect their tr various transport solute substrate specificities. So we began to harbor uh, mutations found in the various transporters and locate them in the various locations within the transporters. Uh, and as we collected more and more, uh, we've started to find out that they were targeted to certain locations uh, and that um, uh, replacements of them here, here, and in these uh, various helices would alter their appetites for different sugars and the bacteria could then differentiate the kinds of sugars they would like to have in case they were uh, available. All right, so we began to collect these uh, mutations and orient these alpha helices in such a manner as to put all the amino acids together to make a, um, a substrate binding pocket or a binding site. At some point, uh, one of the crystal structures of the lactose permease was uh, determined, and many of the mutations that I had found, many of the amino acids that I had found, were found in the substrate binding site. For instance, methionine, arginine, tryptophan, um, aspartate, histidine, glutamate were all found to bind either the sugars or the protons uh, during transport. Uh, and so this was a, a very good uh, molecular tool to identify amino acids that determined how bacteria eat. Okay, so. One of the first things we did as uh, when I became a college professor here at uh, Eastern New Mexico University was I looked at the study of um, the sucrose permease and I tried to get it to mutate so that it would uh, favor a sugar called maltose, which makes you know, malts taste great, uh, and convert it from a sucrose transporter to a maltose transporter. Uh, and we decided to do this because uh, it was known that these various sugar transporters are what we call uh, evolutionarily conserved, that is to say homologous, and if there are subtle changes in their amino acids, you might have uh, profound changes in their function. Okay, so we uh, put the uh, uh, bacteria harboring uh, the maltose or the, uh, the, the sucrose transporter onto Macaque auger, uh, which will turn red if the sugar is transported and fermented. And we found out, uh, without having to mutate it, that the maltose all was already a substrate. So we worked that up uh, physiologically to measure maltose transport in addition to the sucrose transport as a positive control and found that the, uh, the sucrose transporter also transported um, uh, maltose at the same time. So we worked up a kinetic scheme and found out that the affinities of these sugars were uh, very high and the, uh, the, the velocity of the transport through the channels were also very high. Okay, so if we look at the ability of the cells to uh, take up maltose and keep it in the cell, and as well as uh, sucrose, we found out that the, uh, the cells could accumulate many fold more sugar than they had before, showing an active transport system. And then uh, we decided to take a look at um, the transport of sucrose and see if maltose, increasing concentrations of maltose could block the sucrose binding site and likewise see if sucrose could block the maltose binding site. And it turns out that both sugars block the binding to the binding site of each other. And this suggested to us then that the uh, binding sites uh, overlap with each other and it showed us that um, we could look at conserved residues versus non-conserved amino acids uh, as playing a role in this uh, binding site structure. Okay, so that's just a little bit about how bacteria choose to eat. They like to mutate their transport systems to do so. Okay, another area of research that we do 
is, uh, is called antimicrobial agents and their resistances. Antimicrobial agents can be considered medicines uh, for us, poisons to bacteria. Now these uh, antimicrobial agents are known as like uh, antibiotics or um, disinfectants or antiseptics. And uh, we use them to treat diseases that might occur like uh, salmonellosis or cholera or uh, sepsis or other infections. These antimicrobial agents, however, are actually ubiquitous in everyday items like toothpastes or mouthwashes or soaps. Some people even embed these antimicrobial agents within uh, plastics or apparel. So they are very uh, common in, and, have, and enjoy a widespread use uh, in many, many worldwide locations. Now, if you use a medicine like this, a poison to kill the bacteria, those bacteria will die. But those that are intrinsically resistant will live and then they will predominate and become uh, drug resistant. So drug resistance is a company after widespread use. Okay, unfortunately, if you select for a uh, resistance with a single drug, many times those bacteria are multiple drug resistant by default. And so these resistance mechanisms are very poorly understood. One of the mechanisms is known as antimicrobial transporters, and how they work is they just simply pump the drugs out of the cells to dilute their effects inside the cells where their targets are. Now this comes from a review article that we published uh, this year, and this, this slide summarizes some of the uh, resistance mechanisms that bacteria use to survive the onslaught of their poisons. For instance, um, one uh, mechanism is called enzymatic hydrolysis of drugs. And here, uh, the bacteria um, take a drug in this uh, um, blue diamond and modify it and so by degrading it to make it ineffective and therefore the, uh, the antibiotic won't work and the bacterium here uh, will grow. Okay, so that's one way. Another way is to take a drug and modify it in such a way that it no longer is active. This is one way to do it. Um, enzymes can modify those drugs to uh, make them inactive. A third way is to alter the drug target. For instance, um, a target here might be altered in such a way that the antibiotic doesn't bind. Another target here in this case is a ribosome where the antibiotic won't bind. Or in the cell membrane where the target is a lipopolysaccharide that's altered and the antibiotic doesn't bind. So a uh, fourth um, me resistance mechanism is called reduced drug permeability. Here the drug is unable to enter a cell where all the targets can be found. Uh, and they are kept out of the cell, and the cell will be able to live um, without those drugs. And then the last one that I'm interested in is called active efflux of drugs. Here, if the drug happens to get into a cell, and here is one in the cell, it might be pumped out of the cell, or pumped out of the membrane of the cell, therefore diluting the drug inside the cell where all the targets can be found. And in many cases, these multi-drug efflux pumps will pump out of the cell a variety of structurally distinctive antimicrobial agents. Okay, now this uh, figure comes from my uh, wife who helped me uh, publish this paper and designed this uh, figure for us. She uh, noted that uh, many of these efflux pumps are uh, fall into various classes or families, the main family, the uh, major facilitator superfamily, uh, the, AB, the um, uh, ATP binding cassette family, the small multi-drug resistance family, the resistance nodule uh, uh, diversity family. Uh, these various families 
all function by pumping the solids or the antimicrobial agents out of a cell uh, or into a cell, out of a cell, out of a cell, into a cell, or out of a cell. And so these various uh, transport systems can work together to mediate a multi-drug resistance phenotype. Okay, so I'm going to focus on the major facilitator superfamily. It's a very large family of transporters. Uh, many, many thousands of uh, transporters are members of this superfamily. And we know that many of these uh, transporters have a great diversity of solids, raising from sugars, amino acids, ions, antimicrobial agents, and the like. However, they do have different modes of energy. That is to say, some might be passive transport, some might be active transport. We do know that the structures are similar, and I showed you a little bit earlier about how maybe they have 12 alpha uh, helices spanning the membrane. Sometimes they differ in their number, like 14 or 13. But we also know that their amino acid sequences are conserved. And these, what we mean by this is that evolution has chosen to keep them, to use them, to make them have a common function. So these uh, conserved amino acid sequences that are uh, evolutionary kept are called conserved sequence motifs. So the hypothesis we're testing here is that sequence, uh, subtle sequence variations will be responsible for the differences in any transporter functions that we might encounter. One might be the choice of um, antimicrobial agent substrate or direction of transport. Okay, so one way to test this would be to clone the genes that confer resistance, sequence them, compare the sequences, mutate them, and then make molecular models showing how these uh, differences have resulted in changes in function. Okay, so the first thing we did is we cloned the gene. This one was a gene that encoded resistance to tetracycline. And then we uh, sequenced it. And here is the, uh, the, the DNA sequence um, underneath the amino acid sequence. And then we compared the sequences uh, with each other. And here are the amino acid sequences compared. And if you look closely, you can see how some of them have sequences that are present in all of the transporters. Now what I asked the computer to do was to give the every match between different transporters, amino acid transporters, uh, and the, the amino acids in the transporters, and then uh, give them a score for every match. For every mismatch, give them a penalty. And then add up the scores and the penalties and assign a number. And then uh, do the whole thing all over again, but this time, um, randomize one of the sequences a hundred times, let's say, or a thousand if you wish, and then re repeat the uh, alignments um, and compare the real score that we get um, by the number of standard deviations by which the randomized scores differ. And any score that's higher than nine is considered homologous, that is to say, evolutionarily conserved. And many of the scores that we got range from 47 to 15 uh, uh, standard deviations. So we knew then that these transporters were homologous, that is to say, shared a common evolutionary origin. Uh, and this is the uh, common evolutionary origin that I'm talking about. They share a common ancestor, and they are homologous to each other. Notice that the tetracycline transporters are homologous and evolutionarily related to multi-drug resistant transporters. So we noted that one of these sequences was found only in antiporters, and it had a glycine, several glycines, a proline, and several more glycines conserved in the middle of helix number five of the transporter. And it was found only in antiporters and missing in um, uh, SID porters and muni porters where it is completely absent. Okay, so we decided to uh, model this alpha helix, number five, 
the alpha helix was discovered by Linus Pauling, who uh, earned the Nobel Prize for this discovery. And we decided to model the alpha helix number five, and the wild type looks like so. And that one glycine that I showed you, uh, the um, uh, side chain is a hydrogen atom that is found right here. And if I convert it to an alanine, which has a side chain of a methyl group, um, there's two histidines, or I'm sorry, three, three hydrogens. Um, there's one, two, and one right behind it to make that methyl group. Uh, the replacement of this alanine, of this glycine with an alanine, reduced the activity of resistance by about 75%. And if I changed it to uh, uh, one amino acid bigger, right here, a valine, you lose almost all the activity. So a subtle change in the structure has profound changes in its function. OK, we also uh, did some molecular mechanic modeling of the uh, transporter and found that the uh, helix is bent. Uh, and it is only bent if that structure is kept intact. Some other work uh, done by another group found that, that this helix is indeed bent, and there it is being bent, and that the bent helix serves as a molecular hinge structure in the uh, rats. Another group found that the transporter, uh, the antiporter motif in a transporter is not only bent, uh, but also uh, rotates uh, and twisted. So the antiporter motif forms a structure that is not only kinked, but it's also twisted. The uh, antiporter motif was found in Staphylococcus aureus, uh, other bacteria like uh, Bacillus subtilis. It was found in the eukaryo in the yeast, and it is found in uh, rats. Uh, and so it, this antiporter motif is found in not only in bacteria, but also many uh, eukaryotes, and probably including humans. Okay, in another line of work, we studied a uh, uh, resistance uh, mechanism, uh, a resistant uh, determinant called EMRD3, and it is found in a bacterium called Vibrio cholerae which is a dangerous pathogen, causes a, a terrible disease called cholera. And we decided to see, uh, to test the hypothesis that this determinant was a multi-drug efflux pump. So we, cl we cloned the gene, and then we uh, did a, a phylogenetic workup and found that it was um, uh, uh, related to a variety of bacteria, including many Vibrio cholerae bacteria. And when we did a structural workup on it, we found that it had 12 alpha helices, and it contained the antiporter motif in helix number five. There's the uh, conserved glycine right there. We uh, measured the minimal inhibitory concentrations of a variety of antimicrobial agents, and then found out that this uh, EMRD3 protein conferred uh, uh, multiple drug resistance compared to cells that did not have that uh, gene in it. Uh, in one case, it was a hundredfold increase in the resistance of the, um, that drug, uh, linezolid, which is a clinically relevant antimicrobial agent. We did a physiological study, and we, we uh, loaded um, we, we measure the ability of cells that have the pump to accumulate uh, the drug uh, compared to cells that don't have the, the pump and found that cells that don't have the pump accumulate a lot more than cells that do have the pump of the drug. So we knew that it was a, an active transport system. On the other hand, you could load a cell with the drug and then activate it with uh, potassium lactate, and then watch the drug leave the, the, uh, the cell in those that have the pump compared to controls 
lacking the pump. Okay, we could do the reverse experiment where you add protons, uh, I'm sorry, if you add drug and then measure proton transport as opposed to drug transport, and find if you add the drugs, linezolid, erythromycin, chloramphenicol, the protons will be pumped out of the cell. In each case, compared to cells that don't have the pump, which just pump out a little bit of protons, indicating that the cell has other uh, uncharacterized efflux pumps. If you measure the pH changes, in other words, you add more protons or less protons, the activities uh, likewise increase or decrease respectively of uh, the transporters. So we uh, decided to publish this work uh, and it's already garnered a uh, good deal of attention because we believe it's a good candidate for targeting by other agents that might kill and overcome the multi-drug uh, phenotype of these bacteria, make them better drugs. In another study, uh, we, looked, we examined an outbreak of salmonellosis that occurred in Texas and in New Mexico. Portalis was part of that outbreak. Um, and we, we asked the question, because the outbreak lasted only a few months, whether the uh, bacteria of Salmonella enterica were susceptible to medicines or they were not virulent in any way. So we measured the virulence by PCR, looking at various virulence factor genes, and found that all these isolates uh, found in fecal uh, hospital uh, isolates were virulent. They were, but they were also susceptible to many antimicrobial agents, with the exception of one isolate uh, found in New Mexico, uh, the uh, serotype typhimurium, that was resistant to several antimicrobial agents at higher degrees than the other ones. So this one um, uh, uh, isolate um, is multiply drug resistant to amicillin, amoxicillin, clavulanic acid, chloramphenicol, and tetracycline. So should an outbreak occur of this particular uh, strain, uh, that would, might be di more difficult to treat. The other ones, however, were all susceptible to a variety of antimicrobial agents. Uh, and so that is a, you know, a positive thing in case this outbreak might occur again. Uh, in another study, we tested the hypothesis that uh, another um, uh, resistance determinant called LMRS from a clinical isolate of methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus is a multi-drug efflux pump. Now this bacterium is a serious pathogen, a causative agent of staph infections um, found in uh, hospitals, found in the community, and can be quite serious, uh, if not uh, lethal, in, in many cases. So we decided to examine this uh, phenotype, I mean this drug, um, efflux pump, to see if it has a multi-drug phenotype. Uh, so we looked at it as a secondary active transporter, cloned the gene, and did a bioinformatical workup and found out that it has 14 helices, compared to the other one, which had only 12 helices. A, a multiple sequence alignment showed that it was homologous to uh, Staphylococcus aureus of other uh, clinical isolates, but also uh, um, Staphylococcus epidermidis, which is a common skin bacterium, um, Listeria, Bacillus subtilis. Uh, these are all uh, drugs that are uh, uh, bacteria that can cause other infections and the, these bacteria have this multi-drug efflux pump. We cloned the gene and uh, uh, worked up the, uh, the minimal inhibitory concentrations of many drugs and found that it was also another massively diverse transporter of other drugs. Uh, 
Uh, if we did a thin and bromine efflux, we found that the drug was pumped out of cells in, uh, greater than those with the control. And if you add the drugs, linezolid, lincomycin, erythromycin, fusidic acid, the uh, uh, protons would be pumped out in every case. All right, so we, clone, uh, we, we decided to publish this cloning uh, project uh, because it also represents a good target for inhibiting uh, those transporters. Another study we did, we discovered a, uh, an operon that uh, utilizes a, an alcohol sugar called mannitol found in Vibrio cholerae, uh, a dangerous toxigenic uh, pathogenic strain. The operon consists of three genes. We looked first at the first uh, gene in this operon, uh, hypothesizing that it was a uh, transporter of the phosphotransferase system which would uh, phosphorylate uh, the uh, mannitol as it enters the cell. And the cells that have the, the pump uh, will ferment mannitol compared to cells that don't have the pump when you delete the, uh, the MTLA gene. Uh, we um, measured, we, we, uh, we did a structure uh, prediction analysis and found that it was a membrane-bound protein that had an intracellular enzymatic domain that we believe uh, the, uh, the membrane domain will transport the sugar and then phosphorylate it with an enzyme inside the cell. We measured transport and found that uh, cells that have the pump have uh, a, a, a high affinity as measured kinetically. Uh, and then we published this work uh, to denote that this gene confers this transport function. In another study, we looked at the second gene, the NTLD uh, gene, and we uh, uh, did a sequence comparison and found that it was homologous to a variety of bacterial proteins which we believe by uh, sequence analysis um, showed um, that it was an enzyme doing the um, uh, phosphorylation and we purified the protein and then measured the uh, kinetics and found that uh, it was able to phosphorylate um, various mannitol sugars as it enters a cell indirectly. We measured the, the effect of pH on it and found that it had a, a pH optimum. We measured the effects of temperature and it had a temperature optimum. We, com we uh, conducted growth studies and found no difference in uh, Luria botani broth. In cells with a little bit of sugar, we see an increase of the uh, growth of those cells. In minimal medium, lacking uh, the sugars, uh, we saw that the cells that didn't have uh, the pump or the system um, grew a little bit more. Interestingly, we found that if you added the sugar, you enhanced the expression of the MTLD gene in cells uh, that were non-pathogenic compared to cells that were pathogenic. So we uh, cloned, uh, so I'm sorry, we uh, published that uh, uh, second element in the operon. Uh, and so we are known as the discoverers of this mannitol operon in uh, this um, cholera causing bacterium. Another study we did, we uh, determined the entire genome sequence of a non pathogenic. Uh, Vibrio cholerae organism found in uh, Puget Sound, uh, which is an environmentally uh, relevant bacterium, and then compared the uh, sequence of our, our, our um, bacterium with the sequences of many other dangerous cholera-causing bacterium, and found that our bacterium, which is non-toxigenic, had multiple gaps in its genome 
where various genes seem to be missing that were present in the pathogenic bacterium in red, where they seem to have all of those genes. So when we looked at them more closely, we found that these dangerous bacteria harbored uh, many genes for various functions. One is persistence, where if you have a lot of drug in a biofilm, these bacteria would, uh, will persist in those biofilms. They can colonize, they can metabolize various um, uh, agents. They have the cholera toxin. Our clone did not have the cholera toxin. And many of them have antimicrobial resistance genes. OK. <clears throat> we decided to uh, examine the effect of cumin, a food spice, in inhibiting the multi-drug efflux pump, uh, LMRS, from the MRSA. Uh, because um, if you want to inhibit the pump, many of those efflux pump inhibitors are already toxic to humans. So we decided to look for a way to have a non-toxic efflux pump inhibitor. Uh, uh, and we looked at uh, common medicinal plants, food spices, uh, agents that were already uh, known to be safe uh, and known to be approved for human use that we might think uh, would serve to efflux, to prevent efflux. So we uh, measured uh, cumin and its um, um, uh, bioactive agent, cumin aldehyde, and found that all of these inhibited the growth of these bacteria, um, whether it, they lacked the pump uh, in these two cases or had the pump in those cases. OK. If we looked at efflux, here's a, a wild type efflux pump system occurring. And if you add um, um, various uh, amounts of cumin, you reverse this trend and make the cell unable to pump the um, uh, drugs out of the cells. Molecular modeling analysis predicted that Evading amino acid at position 371 is part of the active site to which cumin blocks. Okay, another study, we looked at garlic uh, as a potential uh, antimicrobial agent, and we looked at it, uh, its bioactive compound called allyl sulfide, as a uh, drug that would target the EMRD3 efflux pump. Okay, so the, um, the garlic called allium sativum and its bioactive agent allyl sulfide had uh, active uh, inhibitory activities against all the cells that we tested. So garlic and its bioactive components appear to be generally uh, antimicrobial agents. Uh, and then we ask the question, does the, um, the extract uh, make various medicines work better? And in some uh, cases, we found that the answer is yes, especially with the medicine called vancomycin, in which garlic and um, the um, uh, vancomycin worked 200-fold better or um, 500 fold better than each one separately, which is really a dramatic, surprising result. We found the same sort of a thing with another drug called lincomycin, canamycin, and, uh, and, and to some extent, not as much, chlorophenicol, tetracycline, erythromycin, and linezolin. All of them uh, enhanced the susceptibility uh, when combined with the garlic uh, agent. And then we looked at a process called synergy, whereas if you add the uh, two components together, do they work better together and separately? That's the, uh, what we call synergy. And we found out that synergy occurs with garlic and chlorophenicol, garlic and erythromycin, garlic and canamycin, garlic and linezolid, 
garlic and vancomycin, but not with garlic and tetracycline. So uh, we published that work, and it too has garnered a great deal of attention in the literature. Okay, so that's um, some of the work that we've been doing. Uh, since I talked last time, uh, we have uh, gathered some more data, uh, in, but it is unpublished, uh, brand new. Um, so uh, this, one, this particular project was done by Manisha Ajha, a graduate student of mine who took her uh, PhD with me. She was interested in a compound that uh, Dr. Uh, Young Cho in our department studies called uh, trigonelline. And she examined the ability of trigonelline to um, um, see if it would inhibit our efflux pump in um, Staph aureus. And in cells without trigonelline, uh, they accumulate this much drug. Uh, but in cells with the trigonelline, they accumulate many times more drug. So the trigonelline is an active efflux pump inhibitor. Um, another study done by another graduate student, uh, Nicholas Wenzel, uh, who took his, uh, his master's with me uh, last semester, uh, measured the synergistic effects of uh, parasanthine and theophylline on the ability to make linezolid, another antimicrobial agent, work better and the methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. And he found in certain cases, synergy was enhanced in various combinations of the two drugs, but not so much in other combinations of the two agents. Okay. He also looked at theophylline and caffeine and linezolid and found synergy occurring in those two combinations, two, those two different combinations, the mesolid, theophylline, mesolid, and caffeine, work better together on uh, inhibiting the growth of MRSA than uh, separately. Okay, this is also unpublished work uh, done by uh, Patricia Karkala, another grinder student in my lab, and she um, plated uh, bacteria that had a tetracycline efflux pump all by itself on lincomycin, I'm sorry, um, where is it? Norfloxacin plates, and then waited for mutants to appear on the norfloxacin plates. And she got about 100 mutants. We sequenced um, about a dozen of them and found that one of the mutants, or several of the mutants, had a, an alteration of arginine at position 73 to methionine in motif A, and another one where glycine was changed to a leucine in motif C, known also as the antiporter motif. Okay, well that completes the, uh, my, my research um, aspect of our, our thing, but I'd like you to know that um, you might recognize this particular figure. Uh, it was featured on the cover of the journal this summer. Um, and so we're kind of happy about that. It was chosen to be on the cover out of 141 articles in that particular issue. Uh, future work, however, will uh, focus in on the synergy, the modulation of efflux pumps, and then analyzing uh, more genes for identifying more targets. Uh, it may interest you to know that uh, Dr. Shaughnessy and I uh, published a book titled Inventions and Discoveries of the World's Most Famous Scientists. And um, this uh, book came about when we were having coffee with Dr. Shaughnessy um, at a Christmas party in 2017. And um, in 2018, we published our first, it was my first book. His, 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 uh, he's published many books in this area. Uh, <clears throat> we published another book on famous microbiologists. And um, that book was dedicated to my professor at Harvard, Dr. Thomas Hastings Wilson. I was the chair of that committee that wrote up a so-called memorial minute for, um, uh, that is given to uh, full professors at Harvard. Um, this is uh, Tom and his, and his wife, Dorothy. 
Uh, we have another book um, that we published um, in 2020, last year, on biomedical scientists and their discoveries. And I have my copy over here somewhere. And then uh, we have another um, book that we published on famous biochemists. And this one makes me happy because my wife joined us on this project. And uh, the, the first two books took about a year each to write. But with my wife and on board, it took about three months to write. So she was a, a, a synergistic effect on our, on our writing capabilities. Uh, and then just recently, we just published a book on famous molecular biologists. And I have a copy that the library has here, um, sitting over there. And that just came out. We're very happy about that because I dedicated it to uh, the people who were responsible for teaching me microbiology, uh, molecular biology. My old uh, PhD advisor, Dr. Jeffrey Griffith, that was him then teaching me. And this is him now with his wife, uh, Barbara. Um, the book is also dedicated to Tom Wilson and to uh, Dr. Alonzo Tensio, Margaret Garbarina, who were responsible for paying for my PhD work. OK, well, that completes my presentation. Uh, if you are interested in um, working in our laboratory, please do come and see me. Uh, I'm housed in Roosevelt Hall, room 101, and I'm glad to put you in the lab and put you to work. Uh, come and visit us anytime. Uh, these are just some of the people who did much of the work that I talked about this morning. OK, so these are the um, our collaborators and the funders of our projects. Right, well, again, thank you so much for uh, listening in on this presentation. Uh, and I also thank Dr. Hauser and Dr. Montgomery for the invitation. Uh, have a great day.